Hello, my name is Dr. Dharmit Phelan. I am a Director of Cardiovascular Imaging at Atrium Health Sanger Heart and Vascular Institute. I'd like to thank Dr. Riglin and Dr. Sarek for this very kind invite to speak to you today. I'm going to be talking over the course of the next 30 minutes about a normal transthoracic echo, Doppler echo, and normal antegrade flow patterns. And really, since the 1950s, when Edler and Hertz first described and discovered uh, M-mode echocardiography, we have come a long, long way where we now can create these really exquisite echo images. But it can really be intimidating to begin with. Um, so for the next half hour, I'm going to try and make this as simple as possible. And really, I'm going to be referring heavily to this particular guideline, uh, the guideline for performing a comprehensive TTE. And many of the images and videos are directly taken from this particular guideline. We'll also refer to the recommendations for cardiac chamber quantification. I'm gonna break this talk into three segments, instrumentation, the complete TTE, and Doppler echo with normal flows. And so if we get, begin with instrumentation, we'll begin by talking about two dimensional imaging. And really it is important that operators who are doing transthoracic echoes are, should be familiar with these settings that contribute to the quality of the overall image. Some of these settings are fixed, that can't be altered, but many of them are not. And they can dramatically improve the image quality, but more importantly for you uh, folks here today, they're easily questionable. Now, many of these are going to be covered again in future lectures, particularly in the physics lecture. So you don't have to know all of these right now, but I think building in some redundancy is important. I'm going to begin by just talking about some transducer movements. Uh, and the first that we'll talk about is tilting the probe. And this is really where the probe maintains the same axis and we, we move the bottom of the probe up or down to be able to cut different imaging planes of the heart as we can see in this animation. As you tilt the probe anteriorly, posteriorly, you can go from the RV to a five chamber, four chamber, and then get back into this view where we see the CS. The sweep is really something we use a lot in pediatric echo, where we record multiple images, uh, multiple tilting or, or different views of the heart in one single clip. Rotating the probe returns, refers to keeping the probe in one single imaging plane, but moving the index marker. And so here we see that moving the index marker 90 degrees at the parasternal long axis will move you from a parasternal long to a parasternal short axis view. Sliding the probe refers to moving up or down an intercostal space. And rocking the probe really tries to center the view uh, into the center of the heart by moving the probe either towards or away the, toward the, the index marker, while angling the probe is a little bit like rocking, but a little bit more complex movement where we can focus in on different areas of the heart. So, Moving on to some of the settings and instrumentation that we can, we can set up on our machine. One of these is the grayscale maps that we have. And for some people, they like to colorize this map and view these images in different colors, such as sepia. It's important to note that the information displayed does not change. It's more the perception of the viewer. Dynamic range or compression is something that is questioned a lot in the boards. Um, it, it basically changes the ratio that uh, between the highest and lowest amplitude echo. So a low dynamic range gives us a very kind of black and white image like this image here uh, on the right, while a high dynamic range gives multiple more uh, shades of gray. So sometimes for more difficult imaging, we might choose to use a low dynamic range. The transmit frequency really refers to the frequency of the imaging transducer, and these usually range between two and five megahertz in adults. What we try to do is use the highest frequency possible because that gives us the best imaging resolution. Um, but the higher the uh, frequency, obviously, the lower the penetration into the body. So we have to kind of consider that trade-off as we're, as we're imaging. The sector depth and sector width are really two things that are important for us to consider anytime we're imaging because they really affect the temporal resolution. When we have a very deep image like here uh, on the left hand screen, um, it, it, it really causes, it takes a lot of time for those uh, scans to go all the way down to that deep anatomy and return to the probe. 
And so when we do that, the, the machine has to compensate by either reducing the frequency or reducing the quality in terms of number of scan lines. And the same thing applies to the sector width. The wider the sector, the lower the frame rate, uh, as you can see here on the far uh, right-hand panel uh, versus the, the third right-hand panel. The focal zone is really important for us to consider uh, in terms of optimizing our image quality for a particular region. So the focal zone is really the narrowest part of the ultrasound beam, and that gives us the best lateral resolution. And so here we can see the focal zone is up toward the apex on the left-hand screen. We're really focusing on that, whereas the focal zone is more towards the base here on, on the, the right-hand screen. The time gain compensation uh, is a uh, refers to these knobs that we see on the machine. And when we think about it, you know, sound waves are really attenuated as they go further into tissue quite dramatically. And yet we want the whole imaging plane to look fairly homogenous. So we really usually have to increase the signal um, intensity and amplitude at those further out fields. Uh, on the, on the left-hand panel here, we can see that there's some banding where the time uh, uh, gain compensation has not been set very well. When we think of, of spectral Doppler, really the spectral Doppler, we have got uh, three options available. We have pulse wave Doppler, and pulse wave Doppler has the benefit of selecting exactly where uh, you're trying to measure velocities of flow. So essentially, uh, this has is, is specific for that. The, the, the limitation with pulse wave Doppler is that it can't measure very high velocities. Um, the high pulse repetition frequency is where operators wish to measure velocity at a, at, a, at a particular point, but the pulse wave Doppler is not able to because those velocities are too high. So usually they will send out two sample volumes. The limitation of this is that uh, it, it does have some range ambiguity, um, but usually we're able to figure that out by the clinical uh, suspicion or, or clinical awareness of the flow. The continuous wave Doppler really is useful for measuring high velocities. The uh, limitation with continuous wave Doppler is that there is range ambiguity there. So when we're uh, talking about pulse wave Doppler, one of the issues, as we said, is that it can't measure very high velocities. And sometimes, like on the panel on the, on the far left here, we can see that the, the, the bottom of the velocity here is cut off. And there's a couple of things that we can do to try and adjust this. One is we can adjust the scale, and this refers to the velocities that can be displayed. So here, the maximum scale is 80 meters per second. If we increase this, to 120 centimeters per second, I should say, we can see that. The other thing we can do is change the baseline. So we can shift the baseline upwards uh, as we can see on the uh, far uh, right-hand panel. The sample volume is important to consider when we're trying to measure pulse wave Doppler. Uh, this really refers to these two lines that you see uh, on your pulse wave Doppler, how wide or close they are. Um, and if they're very wide, we kind of get what we call, describe as spectral broadening, which makes it difficult to identify the true velocity. Whereas when we make those uh, sample volumes smaller, we're able to see what we call the modal velocity, a more clear uh, peak velocity that we can measure a little better. The gain refer, amplifies the, the doctor's signal before display. And so if the gain is too low, we're not able to see the sample volume. If the gain is too high, we get that spectral broadening. So again, we want to alter that grading, gain, uh, gain setting to get the optimal setting there. And finally, with tissue Doppler, really this is generally a preset. These use larger sample size and lower velocity scales because we're usually measuring the myocardium as opposed to blood flow. And here's an example of normal tissue Doppler, but if you use your regular pulse wave Doppler in the same position, you really don't get the same signal at all, right? Moving on to color Doppler, really what we're using color Doppler for flow is to measure the blood flow characteristics. So the timing, the direction, the velocity, if there's turbulence and so on. So for a, a color map, we're usually using these color displays. Uh, 
Uh, black really represents no flow as flow goes towards the probe. In low flow, it is in a kind of a darker red color as the flow increases in velocity, it turns more bright yellow. As the flow goes away from the probe, darker flow is blue. As it, as it increases in velocity, it goes towards a, a white flow. For turbulent flow, it causes a kind of mosaic color, while you can also use something called variance, which gives you a kind of green yellow flow for that turbulent flow there. Again, we're always trying to think about how we optimize image, optimize the temporal resolution. And we put our region of interest for color flow. We want to make sure we capture the area of interest, but not too big, because if you increase the region of interest, your frame rate suffers. Gain is really important for color flow. We need to optimize this. And when we're doing that, we want to increase the gain such that we start to see a speckling appearance outside of the blood pool. And then we back off until that speckled appearance goes. And this can really, if the gain is not set correctly, can really throw us off in terms of what we think is high flow or low flow. Moving on to the scale, the scale really represents the range of velocities that can be displayed. And, and usually we just, we talk about the Nyquist limit here. And so here's an example on the left-hand side where we have a Nyquist limit of 0.69 meters per second. And you can see the aliasing there. While if we increase the velocity to 0.77, that aliasing glows away. And this is particularly important when we're thinking about displaying uh, things like regurgitant uh, volumes. If the scale is set too low here, mitral regurgitation can look very severe. It, it, here it's in the too low, the aliasing velocity is set at 35. If it's set too high, like at 73, the MR looks very small. So ideally we want this set somewhere between 50 and 70 there to get the ideal view. Now there are times where we want to set the scale lower and that's in situations where the flow is low. So for example, in the atria, when we're trying to look at a shunt across the interatrium, we might want to set the scale at about 30 uh, meter or 0.3 meters per second to be able to see that low flow. So let's move on to what we do for a complete transthoracic echocardiogram. So we have the patient uh, lying flat, usually on the left-hand side, uh, and we're going to begin with a parasternal long axis view. And this is a view where we place the probe uh, close to the sternum with the index marker pointing towards uh, the right-hand shoulder there. And we'll begin with a increased depth where we can see pleural effusions or pericardial effusions and then we're going to drop our depth to be able to get a good view of all the structures in that parasternal long axis view. And we're going to make our measurements here. We're going to measure the RVOT, the interventricular septum. We're going to be careful not to include the RV trabeculation or moderator band in our measurements of the interventricular septum. We're going to measure the left ventricular end diastolic diameter, making sure we're at the leaflet tip and that we're running uh, perpendicular to the long axis of the ventricle. And then we're going to measure the posterior wall, making sure we don't include those or mitral valve trabeculations, if our, our, our subavular structures, I should say. Uh, if there is a septal knuckle, we're going to go a little bit more distal into the ventricle to make that measurement. We don't want to overestimate LV mass. If we have X plane on our machine, we use this be able to line up the largest diameter. And one of the clues we can see is that if we have a parasternal long axis view when you're seeing the papillary muscles, that tells us we're probably not in the center of the ventricle more over to one side. We also want to measure the ventricle in systole, the RVOT, and the left atrium. Now, we also will use M mode. And M mode, as I said, is great temporal uh, resolution. And so if we want to look for high velocity, uh, objects will use M mode, but we've kind of gone away from using M mode to make a lot of these measurements because we often end up cutting the ventricle in a tangential way like we do here, where the LV end diastolic dimension was measured at 51 versus 45 when we used 2D and we had that uh, lined up properly. We're then gonna focus in on the LVOT and the aortic root, and we're gonna make some measurements here Firstly, of the annulus and then of the LVOT. Both of these measurements are done in mid systole 
using an inner edge to inner edge technique, while then we're going to move, look at the aortic root, the sinotubular junction and the mid ascending aorta. These measurements are going to be done in end diastole using a leading edge to leading edge technique. From that parasternal view, we can then tilt the scan plane anteriorly to get a RVOT or RV outflow view. We can do the opposite, tilt the probe inferiorly or posteriorly, I should say, towards the, the patient's hip. Uh, and then we get the RV inflow view here, where we see the tricuspid valve, the in IVC, and you can see the uh, coronary sinus just sneaking in here. From that parasternal long axis view, we're then going to rotate the probe, uh, keeping it in the same position, but rotating that index marker over toward, uh, from, from the right-hand shoulder over to the left-hand shoulder, uh, and we're going to optimize that image here. And here, starting from the bottom going up, we have the left atrium, the interatrial septum, the right atrium, tricuspid valve, RVOT, pulmonary valve, and in the middle, we have the aortic valve. And so this is an important view to focus in on multiple structures. We're going to view each of these valves, usually using zoom uh, and using color Doppler to interrogate all of the valves from this view. By going up an intercostal space, we can sometimes get a very nice view of the bifurcation of the pulmonary arteries, as you can see here. We're going to zoom up on the aortic valve and remember those coronary cusps. They will come up on your exams. Anterior cusp. Is the, is the right coronary. The cusp closest to the um, uh, interatrial septum is the non-coronary, and the other cusp is the left coronary. We're again, then going to tilt our probe downwards towards the um, left nipple, and here we'll get a short axis view of the mitral valve, and if we're right at the tips, we can even measure the mitral valve opening, although this is usually better done using X-plane from a long axis view. Uh, and then we're going to scan down through the ventricle and, and get some short axis views there. Important to get all of these views from the base, the mid, and the apex, because these are going to help us look at for, for regional wall motion abnormalities there. We're going to make some important measurements. The proximal and distal RVOT and the pulmonary artery will all be measured inner edge to inner edge in end diastole. We're then going to move down toward the apex and we're going to place the transducer at the apical impulse, usually at the fifth intercostal space with the index marker pointing towards the bed. And here we get this beautiful uh, four chamber view. Very important that we avoid apical foreshortening here. The, the axis is a term you'll hear a lot and this really refers to the ideal projection of ultrasound through the apex of the heart. And this is not an ideal projection. We're too far up here. We're not getting that kind of um, uh, bullet-shaped apex. This uh, is very rounded and you can see the apex diving down towards the annulus. And so this is a very foreshortened view. And when you do that, you're not seeing the apex properly. And so you may miss important wall motion abnormalities. Once we've optimized that image, we're going to do a more zoomed view. We're going to take in a little bit of the atrium of the four chamber view. We're going to use this view to calculate our biplane uh, volumes. We're going to use this for our 3D and we're going to use this to uh, measure strain. We'll then do an RV focus view. And this usually takes a little bit of counterclockwise of the uh, motion of the probe to get this RV view in perfectly. And, and again, we're going to use this view to make a number of measurements. We'll do tissue Doppler of the tricuspid annulus. We can measure fractional area change. We can do strain and we can also do TAPSI, which is where we place M mode at the tricuspid annulus and we measure the excursion during systole and that's usually greater than 16 millimeters. By tilting the, the, the probe anteriorly, we can go from a three chamber to a five chamber where we bring in the aortic valve. This is where we're going to do our Doppler interrogation of the aortic valve. And then by a, 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 tilting the probe in the opposite direction, we can bring in the coronary sinus here and you can see the eustachian valve as the uh, inter, inferior vena cava comes in here on this bottom, uh, bottom um, right-hand image. For a two-chamber view, as we're in the four-chamber view, we're going to rotate the probe 60 degrees counterclockwise. 
uh, in the two chamber view will begin with a view seeing the full left atrium. We can often see the uh, left atrial appendage here and the coronary sinus uh, over here uh, on this panel. And then we're going to zoom up again like we did for the four chamber. Again, important to do our strain measurements and our, um, uh, our volumes using this zoomed up view. Then to get the three chamber view, we're going to rotate a further 60 degrees and we can get in this view where you've got essentially a similar view as we did for the parasternal long axis view. Again, we're going to in one image take the full left atrium and then we're going to lower the depth there. And so for our measurements, we really need to do the, the, the ASC recommend doing a biplane um, a stack of discs or summation of disc method to uh, evaluate the left ventricular volumes and ejection fraction. And essentially, we're going to trace the endocardial border, both in systole and diastole. We uh, keep the papillary muscles and the uh, trabeculations in the ventricle. We exclude them. Uh, and we can calculate our uh, ejection fraction in that way. Uh, and then, obviously, we need to uh, now recommend it to do 3D volumes also. And again, it really comes down to how good your image quality is uh, to make sure that your uh, 2D image quality is good to be able to get a good 3D uh, image. And you want your frame rate as high as possible there. We also want to measure the left atrial volume uh, at N systole. And uh, we're going to exclude in a four chamber view the pulmonary veins and the left atrial appendage here and draw a straight line down from the annulus down to the posterior wall in both a um, four chamber and a two chamber. And we can use the area length method or the summation of discs here for the uh, left atrium. We do a similar thing for the right atrium just in a single plane. And then we're going to measure the uh, RV uh, linear dimensions, and ideally the RV area also using that RV focus view. We then move down to a subcostal view. We'll usually get the patient now to roll onto their back and relax their abdominal muscles, maybe bend their knees up a little bit. We're gonna put the transducer in under the xiphoid process with the index marker pointing over to the left-hand side of the patient. And we can get this beautiful four chamber view here. Uh, in a subcostal view. And this is really where uh, we want to interrogate for shunts across the interatrial septum, across the ventricular septum, and we want to make our measurements of our RV free wall because all of these structures are perpendicular now. Rotating the probe 90 degrees and turning towards the liver, we're able to get in the IVC and we'll make some important measurements of the IVC there and we can get the patient to take a quick sniff in because that's going to give our estimated estimation of uh, right atrial pressure. Uh, and we can also bring in the hepatic veins that we want to pulse. The final view uh, in a standard echo is going to be the suprasternal notch. A patient's going to lie supine with a pillow behind their shoulders uh, and usually turn their face leftward. The transducer is placed into it with the uh, into the suprasternal notch facing at about 12 o'clock initially, and then gradually rotating the probe to about one o'clock and tilting uh, toward a plane that cuts through the right nipple and the left scapula. And we can bring in this beautiful view of the aortic arch there. So let's talk about the Doppler uh, echocardiogram and normal antegrade flows. And, and the Doppler echocardiogram physics will be gone through in future lectures, but really we're, we're using Doppler in multiple ways. And as I said, color Doppler is a form of Doppler. And we're really using this to look at valve flow, looking for regurgitation uh, or stenosis. We're looking for shunts. We're looking for flow in the, in the great vessels. And we're also looking for flow in the veins. And, and finally, we can use 3D to get some spectacular um, images, but also these are very useful uh, to, to better define where the flow is coming from and to be able to calculate things like 3D vena contractus. In terms of, of spectral Doppler, we'll begin by talking about spectral Doppler of the RVOT. Uh, we usually get this from a parasternal short axis view. Our sample volume is usually big. The flow is smaller here, so usually about four to five uh, millimeters, uh, about five to 10 millimeters from the pulmonary valve. And here we're using that modal velocity, that brightest signal 
uh, to measure the, the RVOT VTI. We then can switch over to continuous wave. Again, we're gonna measure the VTI and the peak velocity. We're gonna translate these using the Bernoulli equation to measure uh, the mean and peak gradients across the RVOT to look for things like pulmonary valve stenosis. If there's pulmonary regurgitation, we're going to evaluate that also, and we can measure this end diastolic flow to give an estimate of um, pulm end diastolic pulmonary pressures. Using spectral Doppler of the tricuspid valve, we'll use continuous wave Doppler across the tricuspid valve. This is really important to get an estimate of the right ventricular uh, systolic pressure. Uh, if we can't get a good signal, we should consider using ultrasound enhancing agents. Occasionally, uh, we will measure the RV inflow view a little bit like the mitral valve view that we'll talk about in a moment. For the mitral valve, we're gonna place a pulse wave Doppler um, a one to three millimeter sample, usually at the tips, usually towards the lateral wall. And we're gonna measure the peak of the E wave, the passive filling, the deceleration time, the peak of the A wave are standard. We may also want to measure the A wave duration. This is obviously A wave is the active atrial filling. We can use Valsalva, which will drop our preload. And in a normal situation, both the E and the A will reduce by about 20%. If there is elevated pressures, we may get a, a reverse flow there uh, with a, a reversed EA, which would suggest higher filling pressures. We have to be careful not to comment on um, mitral inflow if there is tachycardia where that E and the A wave can fuse. At least it can make it difficult to measure diastolic flow. If there's any evidence of stenosis, we're going to use continuous wave and we can measure peak and mean velocity and measure the pressure half time there. And if there is mitral regurgitation, we're going to use that continuous wave Doppler to measure the peak velocity in the mitral valve VTI, which is going to go into our calculations for uh, our mitral regurgitant volumes and fractions. Moving into the LVOT, again, we'll use a spectral, a pulse wave Doppler, either in the five or the three, three chamber view, usually using a sample volume of about five millimeters. If the velocity is particularly high or there's aliasing, we can consider using the HPRF. Uh, we're also going to use continuous wave Doppler through the LBOT. And we're going to measure the mean, uh, the VTI for the mean gradient and the peak velocity for the peak gradient across that aortic valve when we're evaluating for aortic stenosis. And if there is aortic stenosis, we should certainly image using the non-imaging uh, transducer, the PDOF probe, and use multiple windows, including the right sternal border and the suprasternal notch. And we're obviously going to also measure for aortic regurgitation if that's present, and we'll measure the peak velocity and the pressure half time to get a sense of that degree of aortic regurgitation there. For the aorta, we're gonna use a sample volume of three to five millimeters. Here we've got flow in the ascending aorta, flow is going toward the probe. Here we've got flow in the descending aorta, flow is going away from the probe there. We're gonna look for flow reversal in the descending aorta. And the first thing we think about when we see holodiastolic flow reversal is aortic regurgitation, severe aortic regurgitation. But we have to remember that there are multiple other things that can cause holodiastolic flow reversal. And oftentimes this is related to a non-compliant aorta uh, in an elderly person. If we get this kind of sample in the descending aorta, uh, we know that we're dealing with most likely an aortic coarctation there. When we're looking at the uh, venous flow, we'll look at the um, uh, hepatic veins. This is gonna be particularly important as we deal with problems with the right ventricles and, and tricuspid valve or pericardial uh, disease. We're gonna use a three to five centimeter sample or millimeter sample volume and go about one to two millimeters into the vein. We'll see an S wave going toward or, or going away, uh, a D wave, and then an A reversal as that right atrium contracts and pushes blood back into the hepatic vein. And we're not really so worried about the velocities here. We're more looking at the pattern of flow. And it's a very similar pattern of flow for the pulmonary vein with an S wave and a D wave with an A reversal coming from the pulmonary vein. Finally, our tissue, our tissue Doppler, we're going to measure an S wave 
then an E and an A wave. And this is really looking at the longitudinal motion of the mitral annulus and the tricuspid annulus. And usually this is done using a preset and it gives us a lot of information about the diastolic function of the heart. So that is really the uh, talk for today. We didn't touch upon the use of contrast or strain because there's going to be talks dedicated to those. I hope you found this useful and I hope you enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you very much.